sorry. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Y'all are the world's worst audience. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. You're the best audience now. So. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kathy Schlenfiles, and I am the director of the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. And I have the distinct honor and humbling privilege to introduce today's speaker. But before I get to that um, privilege and honor, I want to give a shout out to some people who really made this event happen. And the first shout out goes to Susanna Richards. If you could actually stand, please. Thank you. Stand. Thank you. So, as Susanna knows, um, at, along with Angela Rolla and Sheila Kutzko, like we have uh, dreamt for years to get Jean to just made it work. So thank you so much. Um, in addition to Suzanne, I really want to thank my esteemed colleague and good friend, Kay Capshaw-Smith, whose uh, Writers uh, for Children's Literature funded this event, so thank you so much. I won't ask you to stand, but this is not a precedent. I just wanted to highlight Susanna there. Um, I also want to, <laughs> no problem. Um, I want to highlight you in different ways. Um, so, but I, I also want to thank Angela Rolla and Sheila Kutzko from the Asian American Cultural Center, a co-sponsor for this event. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank my staff, Faye De Los Santos and Maxine Smested Haynes, who actually work behind the scenes and make everything possible. Uh, now to the introduction at hand. Um, so um, I have the privilege of introducing Jean Luen Yang, um, who received his uh, BS in 1995 from the University of California at Berkeley, and an MA in 2003 from California State University at East Bay. From 1998 to 2015, and I'm going to call him Gene, and as you'll find out, he is just one of the warmest, most amazing people, even though he's a superstar. Um, Gene taught computer science and served as Director of Information Services at Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland, California. His additional publications include The Shadow Hero, 2014, and Level Up, 2011, and he has written for Avatar, The Last Airbender. Uh, Jean has taught at Hamline University's MFA program in writing for children and young adults since 2012 and is currently serving as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature uh, this year. He has produced full-length graphic novels, short stories, and serial comics, many of which explore present-day and historical events through the multivalent uh, lens of the Asian American experience. He was recently named a 2016 MacArthur Genius Fellow. Um, and I think that the site really summarizes uh, why he's so uh, wonderfully uh, unique and spectacular. Um, according to that site, um, Jean's work demonstrates the potential of comics to broaden our understanding of diverse cultures and people. He is leading the way in bringing diverse characters to children's and young adult literature and confirming comics place as an important creative and imaginative force within literature and art. Such provocative uses of graphic narrative are most certainly at the forefront of one of his most famous works, American Born Chinese, wherein, wherein Jean masterfully negotiates the terrains of US comic and China, Chinese folklore to narrate the complexities of the Chinese immigrant experience. Likewise sophisticated uh, is the storytelling embedded in Boxers and Saints, a two-volume work of historical fiction that evocatively chronicles by way of two contrasting viewpoints the Boxer Rebellion. His most recent work includes the very intriguing Secret Coders, a mystery involving computer coding, and the new Superman series. As I bring this introduction to a close, I actually want to end with a personal note. As a mixed-race Cambodian-American who grew up in the heart of Texas, and as one of only two Asian Americans in my school, uh, the other happened to be my twin brother, I know firsthand and quite intimately the value of Jean's work. Admittedly, I wish I had access to it then. I would have been less inclined to try to hide who I was. I would have been prouder of my immigrant heritage, and I would have seen at a much earlier age and stage my family as part of, part of a larger and diverse U.S. imaginary. It is therefore with considerable appreciation and admiration that I stand here today before you and our speaker, and please help me join, please join me in welcoming Jean to the stage. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for making it snow during my visit here. I'm from California. That's not a thing that happens a lot. And also thank you, Kathy, for that amazing introduction. I really wish 
my wife could have heard it. I think I could have gotten a lot of points. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit more about myself. My name is Gene. This is what I look like in real life. That is what I look like as a cartoon. I'm a cartoonist, which means I write and draw comic books and graphic novels. Now, I have been doing this for almost 20 years now, and here are some of the comics and graphic novels that I've worked on during these past 20 years. About five years ago, I got involved with these books right here. Now, how many of you have ever seen the show on Nickelodeon called Avatar The Last Airbender? Okay, cool, almost everybody. If you didn't raise your hand, you should feel a little bit ashamed. Because this is probably the best American animated series ever. It ran on Nickelodeon from 2005 to 2008. And it was so popular, Nickelodeon decided to do the sequel show called The Legend of Korra, which wrapped up maybe a year and a half ago. In the world of Avatar, Avatar is set in this fantasy world that's based on real world Asian cultures. In the world of Avatar, 70 years pass from the end of the first show to the beginning of the new one. So Nickelodeon asked this comic book company called Dark Horse Comics to produce a series of graphic novels that would fill in this 70 year gap. That would basically tell you what happens to Aang and all his buddies as they get older. One of the editors at Dark Horse had read some of my stuff before, so she called me up. She asked me if I'd be willing to write these for them, and I jumped at the chance because I am a huge Avatar fanboy. So like I said, I've been working on these for about five years now, and the best part of this gig is I get to call Mike DiMartino and Brian Konitzko, the two animators who created the original show. And they totally call me back. It's awesome. It's like we're best friends. The other awesome thing about this, this working on the series is um, Guri Huri, the artists, and I, we get to take ideas that Mike and Brian and their team had for the show, but couldn't fit in to all those three seasons. And we get to take those ideas and kind of run with them. So for instance, one of the things that they really wanted to do during the show was introduce a group of women warriors from the Fire Nation, almost like a Fire Nation version of the Kyoshi Warriors. That didn't fit in any of the shows that ended up on the cutting room floor. That was an idea that Guri Hiru and I were able to pick up and run with. So in the fourth storyline right there, we introduce you to the Kamuri Kaji, who are these women warriors from the Fire Nation. Now, Avatar The Last Airbender is not the only licensed property that I have worked on. I also did a 10-issue run on Superman, the very first superhero of them all. Did you all know this? That Superman is the very first superhero? That means that every other superhero out there, Spider-Man, the Hulk, Captain America, and even Batman are in some ways just clones of Superman. <laughs> now the best part of this gig was that I got to work with an artist named John Romita Jr. If you've read any superhero comics any times in the last 20 years, you probably have read some of John Romita Jr.'s stuff. In the 90s, he worked for Marvel. He did runs on Daredevil and X-Men and Avengers. You know that Daredevil show that's on Netflix right now? That is largely based on John Romita Jr.'s work. So all that blood started with John Romita Jr. <laughs> when I was in high school, I used to go to local comic book conventions and line up to get John Romita Jr.'s autograph. Now, he and I have a run on Superman together. It's just, life is just really weird sometimes. You guys, a lot of weird things is gonna, are going to happen to you when you get older. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Superman is actually not the first superhero that I wrote. That would be the Green Turtle. And I want to talk a little bit about this book towards the end of my presentation. For most of my presentation, I want to talk about me. So I am an Asian American cartoonist. First, I'm going to tell you how I became each of these things. I'm going to tell you how I became a published cartoonist and also how I became an Asian American. And then after that, I want to tell you about how these two things kind of come together. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the Shadow Hero. So I became an Asian American in 1973 by being born. <laughs> I was born to two immigrant parents. My mom was born in mainland China, my dad in Taiwan. They both came over to the United States for graduate school. They met, fell in love, got married, and had me. This right here is probably the cutest picture of me ever taken. I was about three years old, a little bit downhill after this. But when I was growing up, you know, I lived in a house full of stories. Both my mom and my dad loved to tell stories, and I loved listening to their stories. The vast majority of stories that both my mom and my dad told were from Chinese culture. And I think this was their way of keeping me connected with the culture that they left. 
I think this is true of a lot of immigrant households. A lot of immigrant parents will tell their kids all sorts of stories from that culture that they left as a way of maintaining that connection. So I grew up with stories. I also grew up drawing. My mom tells me that I started drawing when I was two years old and I basically haven't stopped. So naturally, when you take stories and drawing and you add them together, you get animation. Animated movies, animated television series, that was the very first time that I realized that you could tell stories through drawing. When I was a little kid, I loved watching cartoons. I loved watching cartoons at the local theater. I loved watching cartoons on my television set because I realized that these people who were making these cartoons were telling stories through drawing. That was something that I really wanted to do. In fact, when I was really young, my life's ambition was to work for this guy right here. This, of course, is Walt Disney. When I was in third grade, our teacher made us do these biography reports. I chose to do mine on Walt Disney, and after that, I got kind of obsessed with him. I remember going to the library and checking out as many books about Walt Disney's life as I could. I remember looking up in the encyclopedia what the date of his death was, because I was hoping that it would match my birth date, because that would mean that I might be his reincarnation. Now that didn't work out, but I even went to my local mall, we used to have this poster store there, and I special ordered a poster of his head. Like not Disneyland, not any of the Disney characters, I ordered a poster of Walt Disney's head. I put that up over my bed in my bedroom, and my friends would come over and they'd be like, why do you have this picture of a creepy old man in a bedroom? <laughs> And I'd have to tell them, that's not just any creepy old man, that is Walt Disney. So I desperately wanted to be a Disney animator. This all changed one night when I was in fifth grade, and my mom took me to our local bookstore. When I was a kid, every bookstore had what was called a spinner rack. This was a wireframe rack that would carry a month's worth of comics, and you could spin them so that you could see them all. Now, I'm pretty sure before this night in fifth grade, I had seen comic books before. And I might have even read them before. But for some reason, on this night, when I was in fifth grade, in that local bookstore, I saw this issue of Marvel 2-in-1 sitting on that wireframe rack. And as soon as I saw this, something snapped inside of me. I knew deep down inside that I needed to own this. I'm not totally sure what it was that captured my imagination. Marvel 2-in-1 is a series that Marvel Comics doesn't really do anymore. But this is where they used to take two of their characters that didn't normally hang out together and put them together to have some kind of adventure. And in this issue is The Thing and Rom the Space Knight. You all know who The Thing is? Who knows who The Thing is? Okay, almost everybody. The Thing is a pretty popular character. He's part of the Fantastic Four. He shows up in Saturday morning cartoons and summer blockbusters, sometimes summer flops. Who knows who Ron the Space Knight is? Does anyone know who Ron the Space Knight is? A couple of you. One of you I know works at a comic book store. Nowadays, not many people who know who Ron the Space Knight is. Time has just not been as kind to him. Uh, but you can just think of him as like a superhero who kind of looks like a robot who fights crime in outer space. I don't know what it was about this cover that captured me. Maybe just the fact that these two characters look so different from each other, right? They look like they don't even belong in the same era. But they're friends, and I wanted to find out why. So I brought this up to my mom and said, Mom, from the depth of who I am, I need to own this. Will you please buy it for me? And she took one look at this cover and she said, No, absolutely not. Those two characters look way too scary, and they're going to give you nightmares. She made me put this back on the spinner rack. And to this day, I have no idea what the story is about. <laughs> She saw how sad I was, though, about not getting a comic book, so she bought me this instead. Even though I have had the pleasure of writing Superman as an adult, when I was a kid, I was not a Superman fan. I mean, it's obvious why my mom chose Superman over The Thing and Ron the Space Knight, right? Because out of all of the superheroes out there, Superman is by far the best behaved. <laughs> he always does the right thing, he never says any bad words doesn't punch anybody unless he really has to, and afterwards he feels kind of bad about it. He <laughs> flies around Metropolis wearing this blue uniform. He's like this giant flying boy scout going around looking for good deeds to do. Well, I brought this home and I read it, even though I was disappointed. And in this book, the atomic bomb drops in 1986. 
1984 as I'm reading it, so I feel like I'm reading about two years into the future. The atomic bomb drops, kills off most of the people on the planet. The few remnants of humanity that are left gather themselves into these little villages that are pretty lawless. So a group of men have to get together, dress up in medieval style armor, and ride around on these giant mutated dogs to fight crime. They call themselves the Atomic Knights. Superman, being Superman is one of the survivors, so he teams up with these guys. They fight some crime together, and in the last few pages, it's revealed that the whole thing is just a dream that somebody's having. But that did not stop this book from completely freaking me out. I stayed up nights thinking about this, you know, thinking about the bomb, thinking about Atomic Knights, about mutated dogs, about Superman, and about comic books, about how this combination of words and pictures did something inside my brain that had never been done before. Pretty soon after this, just within a few weeks, I went from being a comic book reader to comic book creator. And this is actually one of my favorite things about the comic book medium. That dividing line between who is a reader and who is a creator, who is an amateur and who is a pro, is barely there. It's super easy to cross. If you want to become a comic book creator, all you really need are some pens, some paper, and maybe like a healthy ignorance of your own artistic limitations. <laughs> you just draw a comic and there you are. That's exactly what I did when I was in fifth grade. In fifth grade, my best friend was this kid named Jeremy Kunyoshi, who was half Jewish and half Japanese. And he had been reading comics for years before fifth grade. He started reading comics when he learned how to read. By fifth grade, he had boxes and boxes of comics underneath his bed. Together, we started making comic books together. You know, when our more athletic friends were out on the field playing soccer, we would sit at the lunch tables dreaming up stories together. Then I would do all the pencils, he would do all the inks. We'd give our originals to his mom, who would take him to work, wait till all her coworkers went home, and sneak photocopies for us. <laughs> then we'd take these photocopies, we'd staple them by hand, we sold them to our friends for 50 cents a piece. We made $8, and it was amazing. <laughs> our main character was this character who, a superhero who was just not that great. His name was Spade Hunter, and he was basically a ripoff of Robin Hood. Uh, he wore all green, he lived in the woods, he had a bunch of friends that he called his merry men. Our one innovation was this. Instead of fighting with a bow and arrow, Spade Hunter fought with this discus of death that he would throw at people's heads. We thought that made him cool. So we sold $8 worth of Spade Hunter comics. Uh, when I was a kid, the Statue of Liberty was actually going through these issues. They would run these uh, ads during after school cartoons asking for donations because they said that the Statue of Liberty's nose was about to rust off. Jeremy and I, we love America, so we decided to donate our $8 to the Restore the Statue of Liberty Fund. Our teacher was so proud of us that she gave us these McDonald's gift certificates that were worth more than $8. <laughs> to this day, I, I think that was the best financial decision that I've ever made as a cartoonist. <laughs> Jeremy has since given up on comics. He is now a radiologist. He lives in a giant house in Hawaii. Good for him. But I kept making comics. I kept making comics well into my adulthood. This right here, Gordon Yamamoto and the King of the Geeks, was the very first comic that I did as an adult. I did it when I was in my early 20s. Self-published it. It cost $3,000 for me to get it out into the world. I made maybe 700 of it back. Not a good financial decision. But it was a ton of fun, and it convinced me that I wanted to keep making comics for the rest of my life. Uh, five years after Gordon Yamamoto and the King of the Geeks came out, not five, ten, ten years after this came out, uh, I published Amer American Born Chinese with First Second Books, which is my current publisher, and the response to this book was definitely life-changing. It was well beyond anything I could have imagined. Readers, librarians, teachers, educators of all sorts got behind this book, and they, that support led to me be able, being able to go, become a, a full-time cartoonist, which I am today. I'm so grateful for the amount of support that this book got. Because of this book, I have been involved in comics for about 20 years. And in these last 20 years, I've noticed a few trends in the American comic book scene. One of them is this. I don't know if you all know this, but I think that Asian Americans are probably better represented in terms of number of people working in the industry in American comics than in any other American entertainment industry. There are tons and tons 
of Asian Americans involved in comics. So there's Linda Berry. Uh, she's a really prominent independent cartoonist. She's half Filipino, so I'm claiming her. There's Greg Pak, who writes for both Marvel and DC. Jay Lee is a Korean American who has done a lot of work for the big two superhero companies. There's Debbie Huey, who does Bumper Boy. There's Jason Shiga. There's just a lot of us. A lot. Now, this last person who shows up, who showed up on the screen, is Jim Lee. Jim Lee, in the 90s, worked for Marvel Comics. He did a run on X Men, he did a run on The Punisher. And just like with John Romita Jr., when I was in high school, I used to go to my local comic book store or local comic book convention and line up to get, John, to get uh, Jim Lee's autograph. So Jim Lee is a huge, huge hero of mine. He's like, I'm a, I'm a Jim Lee fanboy. After working for Marvel, he left that company and he founded his own. He founded a company called Wildstorm. He and his team created their own characters. Then he sold those characters and that company to DC Comics. Now he is the co-publisher at DC Comics. He's one of the big bosses there. He's kind of like my boss. Because he is both a fan favorite artist and a co-publisher, because he is involved in both the art side and the business side, some people would argue that Jim Lee is the most powerful man in American comics. The most powerful man in American comics is an Asian American, a Korean American. How could this happen? I mean, parents of Asian Americans all over America are asking, <laughs> how could this happen? Because after all, being involved in comics is not one of the approved career choices, right? It is not doctor, lawyer, and engineer. And this proliferation of this, this abundance of Asian American creators in American comics is even more perplexing when you look at how Asians and Asian Americans have historically been depicted in American comics. Here's an example. This is a political cartoon from an American newspaper in the late 1800s. Uh, and this is actually one of the more mild ones. But back in the 1800s, America saw this huge influx of Chinese immigrant workers. And when this was happening, a lot of Americans got kind of freaked out about it. They were worried about how all these immigrants were going to affect American culture. So pressure began to build on the American Congress to do something about this. Newspapers all over America started publishing images like this. These images presented very stereotypical, exaggerated versions, exaggerated uh, images of, of the, the Chinese and Chinese Americans of the time. These images were meant to dehumanize the immigrants so that America would be willing to do something about them. And they did. Congress in 1882 passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which effectively ended all legal immigration from China in the United States for decades and decades and decades. This sort of image, this sort of dehumanizing image, wasn't just found in early American political cartoons, it was actually also found in early American comic books. DC Comics, the publishers of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, is the oldest of all of the American comic book publishers. What a, a lot of people don't realize, though, is DC Comics did not begin with Detective Comics number 27, which featured the debut of Batman. It didn't even begin with Action Comics number one, which featured the debut of Superman. DC Comics actually began with Detective Comics number one, which was published in 1937, and this is what the cover looks like. That character's name is Ching Lung. He is what we would refer to now as a yellow peril villain as a character who's designed to play on the fears that Americans had of the Chinese. Ching Lung is pretty much a Fu Manchu knockoff. He's this Chinese super genius who's bent on taking over the Western world. So DC Comics, one of the most prominent producers of American pop culture today, began with a yellow peril image, began with an image that was meant to dehumanize an entire people group for the sake of sales. Because DC Comics is our oldest superhero comic book company, their history, I should say our history, because I work for them now, our history is littered with all sorts of characters like this. Yellow Peril villains were super, super popular in the early days of American comics. The most outrageous of which is probably this dude right here. This is a Yellow Peril villain, Chinese super genius, bent on taking over the Western world. His name is Egg Fu, and he's literally a man-sized yellow egg with a Fu Manchu mustache. Egg Fu's superpower is that he could take his mustache and use it like a lasso and use it to wrap around Wonder Woman and her allies. 
Believe it or not, Egg Fu is actually still around in modern American comic books. This is what he looks like in the modern DC universe. Even when Asian and Asian American characters went from the bad guy side to the good guy side, there were still problematic elements to the way they were depicted. During World War II, DC Comics created a team of superhero pilots called the Blackhawks. And let me, sh let me show you the, uh, the, the uniform. This is what the Blackhawks uniform looks like. They fought for the Allies, so there was uh, an Allied member for every there was a member of the Blackhawks for every allied nation, and they all wore these awesome snazzy uniforms. Except for the Chinese Blackhawk. The Chinese Blackhawk looked like this. His name was General Chop Chop. Uh, I gotta tell you, no Chinese in the history of China has ever worn a suit that looks like that. <laughs> Chop Chop wears his hair in a braid. It's, a, it's meant to be a Q. The Q was the hairstyle that men were required to wear during the Qing Dynasty which was the last dynasty of Imperial China. The Qing Dynasty ended in 1911. This comic was published in the early 1940s. And Chop Chop even had uh, like, a, like a catchphrase that he would say whenever he got super mad. He would say, Chop Chop been double clossed, clossed with an L. So these examples are all from DC Comics, but Marvel has had its own share of Yellow Peril villains, the most prominent of which is probably the Mandarin who was essentially Fu Manchu, a yellow peril villain with magic rings. As a superhero fan, as an American comic book fan, I do like reading old American comic books, even when they contain problematic elements like this. I gotta tell you though, uh, a few years ago, I stumbled across this really, really old character from the early 1940s, the early days of American comics, that I thought was well ahead of its time. It was a, uh, a, a comic book character called Fu Chang. And Fu Chang was Asian American before this term Asian American was even created, well ahead of its time. Fu Chang was a backup feature in Pep Comics. Pep Comics' lead feature was this guy named The Shield, who was a patriotic hero in the mold of Captain America. But he actually predated Captain America by about a year. So some people think that maybe Captain America is a copy of The Shield. Pep Comics was published by a company called MLJ, which is still around. Nowadays, they call themselves Archie Comics. Fu Chang was not a superhero, but he did have a magic chess set. This chess set, the pieces of this chess set, would come to life to help him solve crime. And the reason why I was so impressed with Fu Chang was because he was treated with respect. His creators, who were not Asian, who were not Chinese, uh, wrote his backstory in this way. They said that Fu Chang was born in China, came over to the United States to attend an American university, and afterwards settled down in a fictional American Chinatown. Fu Chang dressed in normal American clothing. He spoke English without switching his L's and his R's in perfectly grammatical English. Unfortunately, his nemesis was another yellow peril villain. His name was the Dragon, super creative, and that's what he looked like. And one of the most astonishing things about these early Fu Cheng comics is that they demonstrate to their reader what a difference in skin color an American education makes. <laughs> so the dude on the left did not attend American University, and the dude on the right did. Fu Cheng, in order to activate his magic chess set, would basically put on traditional Chinese clothing and stare at his chess pieces really hard. And here's the other thing. When he did this, his skin color changed. Isn't that crazy? So even when there were, even, even in this really progressive comic, even in this comic that was well ahead of its time, there were still problematic elements. Fu Chang, I think, might be the first Asian American comic book character, but he's not the first Asian American superhero. That distinction belongs to another character, the Green Turtle, who made his debut in 1945. In my opinion, he's the first Asian American superhero. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about him towards the end. But things did get better. You know, things started off rough for Asian and Asian American representation in American comics. Things did get better. In the 1970s, all of America went through this collective obsession with Kung Fu, mostly because of the popularity of Bruce Lee. And American comics were no exception. During the 1970s, uh, all these American comic book companies started putting out these uh, Chinese martial arts inspired superheroes. The most prominent of which is the man on the left, 
His name is Shang-Chi, he's the master of Kung Fu. He's basically like the Marvel Comics version of Bruce Lee. Around this era, we also saw Yang of the House of Yang come out from uh, modern comics. Yang is not prominent at all. He's pretty unimportant in terms of comic book history. I included him on the slide because I like his name. <laughs> then in the 80s, G.I. Joe came around. This is my, this is my era, this is, this is my jam. This is when I was growing up. Uh, G.I. Joe featured an unusual number of three-dimensional characters of color, not just Asian and Asian Americans, but characters of color. And I always thought this was really crazy. I always thought this was kind of weird, you know? On the Cobra side, there was Storm Shadow, who is by far the most psychologically complex of all the villains in G.I. Joe. And on the Joe side, there's this guy named Quick Kick, who was a martial arts master who was such a badass that he never wore shoes, even in the snow. That's how awesome he was. He was also the very first Asian American ladies man that I ever encountered in American media. In the G.I. Joe cartoon, he had a blonde girlfriend. That was the very first time that I ever saw an Asian American character on American television being depicted as romantically attractive and romantically desirable. I always wondered why this was, and as an adult, I figured out why. It was because of a guy named Larry Hama. Larry Hama was a Japanese American comic book writer. He wrote a lot of the early G.I. Joe cartoons. He wrote a lot of the early G.I. Joe comic books. And it was because of him that G.I. Joe was so full of these three-dimensional characters of color. I had the honor of hanging out with Larry Hama a few years ago. We did this event together in New York. And afterwards, we, uh, we went and got some dinner. And I found out that Larry Hama was the reason why Marvel Comics stopped coloring their Asian colors, that, their Asian characters, that bright yellow. Back in the day when Larry Hama was working for Marvel, uh, it wasn't like today. Nowadays, if you work for Marvel or DC, you can pretty much live anywhere you want. But back then, you had to live in New York because you would have to bring your work in every now and then. So uh, one day, Larry brought a finished script into the Marvel Comics office. He visited the coloring department, and he asked the colors straight up, why do we color our Asian and Asian American characters this bright yellow? That is actually not a human skin color. And the colorist said, that's just something we've always done. And Larry said, maybe we should stop. And so they did. Larry Hama, a legend in American comics. In the 90s, X-Men really developed into this bastion of diversity. Uh, there were plenty of three-dimensional Asian and Asian American characters on the X-Men. There was Sunfire, who was a Japanese national who could shoot fireballs out of his hands. There was Jubilee, who really felt like she could have been like one of my cousins. She was a Chinese-American girl who grew up in Southern, uh, South, Southern California, in La Jolla. Uh, discovered, once she hit puberty, that she could shoot fireworks out of her hands. There was also Psylocke. Psylocke started her life as a British young girl. But then, after she became a superhero, she was kidnapped by these ninjas and given an Asian body. So I'm claiming her as one of ours. <laughs> Representation has definitely gotten a lot better as the decades have, have, have gone by. But it still doesn't answer the question of why. Why are there so many Asians and Asian Americans working behind the scenes in American comic books? This is a topic that I like to talk about with my Asian and Asian American comic book friends, usually after a comic book convention, usually over a couple of beers. So what I'm gonna share with you now are three of our drunken theories as to why there are so many Asian Americans in American comics. Drunken theory number one is a theory from the structure of the comics medium. Comics is, by its very nature, a combination of words and pictures. Now, if you look at traditional European culture, words and pictures were always seen as these two separate things. The people who were really good at words were not the same as the people who were really good at pictures. They were seen as two separate disciplines, done by separate people. Whenever words and pictures did come together, the results were seen as either vulgar or childish or immature. Words and pictures in traditional Western cultures were separate. This is not true of the East. I actually think that the reason why this happened was because of the, uh, the Reformation. We can talk about that later if you want. Uh, but, but Asia did not experience a, a, a reformation, right? So if you look at traditional East Asian art, 
words and pictures are almost always together. If you look at traditional Japanese brush painting, or just traditional Chinese brush painting, or traditional Japanese print making, the image is always paired with poetry, always paired with words. A work is not considered complete unless both of those elements are there. A work is not considered masterful unless both, both of those elements are masterful. So maybe something about our cultural heritage prepares Asian Americans for this medium that combines words and pictures. That's drunken theory number one. Drunken theory number two is from the origin of the comic book. What we think of as a comic book today, that format was created in 1933 by these two printing press employees in New York. And within about a decade, it had grown into this mass medium, selling millions and millions of copies uh, every month. Early on, the people who we now consider the masters of the form were all children of Jewish immigrants. So there was Jack Kirby, who was born Jacob Kurtzberg. He was the co-creator of the Hulk, Captain America, Iron Man, the Avengers, X-Men, Fantastic Four. There was Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, who worked together to create Superman. Stan Lee is the co-creator of the Hulk, Captain America, Avengers, X-Men, Spider-Man, and uh, the Fantastic Four. Joe Simon worked with Jack Kirby to co-create Captain America. Will Eisner is considered the godfather of American comics. He did this very influential strip in the 1940s called The Spirit. He was one of the first cartoonists to bring cinematic storytelling techniques into the comic book art form. There was Bob Kane, who was born Robert Kahn. He's the co-creator of Batman. And there's Harvey Kurtzman, who's the founder of Mad Magazine. All hugely influential, influential figures in American comics, all the sons of poor Jewish immigrants. And if you look at early American comic book stories, you can find traces of these Jewish roots. I don't know if they meant to do it or not. I don't know if it was conscious or not, but they, they, they drew pretty heavily on their own cultural heritage to tell their stories. So take Superman, for example, the first superhero. Superman, as an infant, is put into this little metal basket, launched into space to save him from doom. And then, as an adult, he grows up to become the savior of a people. This is a lot like Moses, right? Moses, as an infant, is put into a basket of reeds, launched into a river to save him from doom. He grows up to become the savior of a people. Superman is a strong man who um, has a critical weakness. In his case, it's a glowing green rock. Whenever he comes into contact with it, all of his strength goes away. This is a lot like the hero from the Hebrew scripture, Samson, who's a strong man with a critical weakness that saps him of all of his strength. In his case, it's haircuts. So from their roots, from the very beginning, comics have been a medium for outsiders. They were a medium for these poor Jewish kids who didn't really find uh, a voice for themselves in the culture that surrounded them. They were a way for them to tell their own stories. And maybe Asian Americans are attracted to this outside, outsiderliness, this outsider nature of American comics. In fact, I would argue that there's a lot in these early American superhero stories for an Asian American to relate to. This is actually a theory that I kind of stole from a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Jeff Yang. We're not related. We're only friends. He's the editor of Secret Identities, which is an anthology of Asian American stories, the stories of Asian American superheroes by Asian American creators. Jeff is also a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, but nowadays he's probably better known as the dad of this guy. You all watch Fresh Off the Boat? So the main actor, the guy who plays Eddie, the little kid who plays Eddie, is Jeff Yang's son. So Jeff Yang argues that, you know, um, a lot of these early superhero stories reflect elements of the Asian American experience. And he particularly points to Superman. I think there's an argument to be made that Superman is actually an Asian American. Let me give you the evidence. So number one, he has black hair. He wears glasses. His coworkers consider him to be mild-mannered. He has these two different sets of clothes. He has these American clothes that he wears to work every day. And then he has these funky, colorful, foreign clothes that he busts out on special occasions. He has two names. He has an American name, Clark Kent. He has this foreign name with a hyphen in it, Cal L. His parents are non-English speaking scientists who send their kid to America for a better life. Superman 
might be an Asian American. He might be an Asian American Jew, actually. <laughs> you know, nowadays there's a lot of talk about Superman versus Batman, mostly because of the movie that came out this summer. I gotta ask, do any of you like Batman better than Superman? A few of you, okay. Now, I am not saying you're wrong, okay? So I'm not trying to be judgmental, I swear. I'm just saying that for me, when the choice is between an Asian American Jew who fights for justice and a billionaire who beats up on the mentally ill, I always choose the Asian American Jew. So that's the second drunken theory, that uh, Asian Americans are attracted to the outsider nature of American comics. The last drunken theory is this, it's from American cultural trends. I'm sure you've all noticed this, but over the last decade, decade and a half, America... Okay, so do we have to go?
I have to tell you all, UConn is like the most exciting place I have ever given a presentation. It's amazing. <laughs> thank you all, thank you all again. Thank you all for braving the weather to be here. So, my last Franklin theory, uh, a theory from American Cultural Trends is this. I'm sure you've all noticed over the last couple of decades, America has seen this huge influx of Japanese pop culture, right? We've had Japanese cartoons, we've had Japanese toys, and we've also had Japanese comics. We've had a lot of manga. Manga is now so prevalent in American society that almost every bookstore and library has people like this. We call these folks the Manga Isle Hobos. They just hang out in the Manga Isle and read manga all day. Like I said before, the, the comic book format was created in America in the early 1930s. Pretty soon after that, it was exported all over the world. And in certain places, it took particularly strong hold. One of those places was Japan. Japan fell in love with the comic book format. But pretty soon after, America and Japan, the comic book cultures, didn't really create any sort of cross-pollination. The Japanese market and the American market developed separately and simultaneously. Each came up with their own favorite way of producing and presenting stories and comics. In America, most comics look like what we have on the left. There are these pamphlets, saddle stitched. Every story was anywhere from 20 to 30 pages long. And in Japan, they preferred their stories much longer. Here in America, most of our comics were, were uh, four color, were full color. In Japan, they preferred their stories to be black and white in these volumes that essentially looked like novels. They were several hundred pages long. Uh, a story could run several volumes. And each even developed their own way of using visual language to communicate. So here's an example. Can somebody who reads a lot of manga tell me, what does that little plus sign mean? Yes? Anger. It means anger. This character is angry. That is supposed to represent a vein that is popping in this character's forehead. She's so mad that a vein pops out, right? This sort of visual language was virtually unheard of in American comics until pretty recently. And in Japan, it was so common that it became a symbol. So sometimes you'd see Japanese cartoonists using it like this, where it lost all representational value. It is just pure symbol. Well, because we've had this huge influx of Japanese pop culture into American shores, most American comic book readers under the age of 30 now grew up reading both American and Japanese comics. So they expect their comics to reference both cultures, to combine the language of both East and West. A lot of Asian American creators, people like my friend Derek Kirk Kim. Uh, he and I are actually different people. I know we look a lot alike because he stole my style. But he's a prominent Korean American artist. A lot of people like Derek grew up reading both Eastern and Western comic books, even before Eastern comic books were prevalent in America. Derek actually had them sent over here from his Korean relatives. So a lot of us were combining Eastern and Western visual languages even before it became popular. In a lot of ways, cartoonists like Derek anticipated the current trend in American comics of incorporating Japanese language and Japanese visual artifacts. So unfortunately for our parents, I think this trend is just going to continue. You know, more and more Asian Americans are going to come into American comics and find a voice for themselves there. And I think this is incredibly important because I think this is a trend that is part of a larger conversation that we're having in American storytelling. I'm sure you've all noticed this, but in American movies, in American television, in American books, in American comics, we're having this sustained conversation about diversity. As our society grows more diverse, we want our stories to reflect that diversity. So let me end by telling you uh, about a couple of current projects of mine, or more recent projects of mine. The first one is all about the Green Turtle. Like I said earlier, Green Turtle is my nomination. It's the character that I believe is the first Asian American superhero. I first came across Green Turtle several years ago on the internet, on this blog called Pappy's Golden Age Blog Zine. On that blog, Pappy actually highlights every week an obscure character from the 1940s. And these characters are almost always in public domain because the companies that publish them have gone out of business. On one post, he talked about the Green Turtle, a character who was created by Chu Hing, 
one of the first Asian Americans working in the American comic book market. Green Turtle is not a great character. In a lot of ways, he is a Batman ripoff. He wore a turtle cape and a turtle cow. He operated out of a turtle cave. He drove around in a turtle airplane. He didn't even have a shirt. His costume was horrible. He didn't have a shirt, he didn't have pants. He wore these little triangle pants, gloves, boots, a cape, and that was about it. He ran around bare-chested. But I still found Green Turtle intriguing because of a rumor about his origins. The rumor was this. Chu Hing wanted the Green Turtle to be a Chinese American, like he himself was. But his publisher wouldn't let him do it because his publisher didn't feel like a Chinese American superhero would sell. So Chu Hing reacts by getting really passive aggressive. <laughs> because he's a cartoonist and that's how we deal with adversity. We just get super, super passive aggressive. And he draws these early Green Turtle comics so that you never see the character's face. Most of the panels look like this where the hero has his back turned towards you, so all you see is his turtle cape. And then when he is turned around, something is blocking his face. Either a piece of furniture, or another character, or he's punching, or he punches like this, so that his arm is covering part of his face. The rumor is that Chu Hing drew these characters like this, drew his hero like this, so that he and his reader could imagine the green turtle as he originally intended, as a Chinese American. I don't know if those rumors are true. I tried to talk to some collectors of Golden Age stuff. Nobody can confirm it for me. I think that's just the nature of rumors. But I found it so intriguing that I wanted to do something with this character. Luckily, he was in public domain. Now, Green Turtle actually only lasted for five issues. Believe it or not, he was not very popular. So, Chu Hing never gets around to telling us his secret identity or his secret origin. I saw a hole in comics history that I could fill, so I asked my friend Sunny Liu, an amazingly talented illustrator, to work with me, and together we created the Shadow Hero. The Shadow Hero is our version of the Green Turtle's origin story. In our version, we firmly establish him as the first Asian American superhero. Now, I have to say, one of the reasons why I was so intrigued with the Green Turtle when I came across him on the internet was because he affirmed something for me. You know, superheroes are deeply American. They were created in America, they're most popular in America, and in a lot of ways I think superheroes at their best express America at its best. And one of the things that Asian Americans really struggle with is this perception of foreignness, regardless of how long we have been here, regardless of how long our families have been here, some people still see us as foreign. So to see that there was this character who might be Asian American, dating back to the very early days of superheroes, of this genre that's so deeply American, was just tremendously affirming to me. And out of that feeling of affirmation came this graphic novel. Out of that feeling of affirmation also came this. Uh, I've always dreamed of having one of the characters in one of my comics become an action figure, and it actually happened. Uh, a, a couple of years, uh, a couple of months after the Shadow Hero came out, I came into contact with this company called Fresh Monkey Fiction, a very small company that produces action figures of obscure superhero characters from the 1940s. So I emailed the head of Fresh Monkey Fiction, I told them about Green Turtle, and they were so intrigued that they put this together for me. So if you go on the internet, you can actually buy one of these now. It's like a dream come true. <laughs> Green Turtle also led to my current project with, with uh, DC Comics. I left Superman, the main Superman title, uh, after issue number 50. And after that, I started having these conversations with DC Comics, with Jim Lee, about what might, I might do next for them. And they brought this idea to me. Jim Lee wanted there to be an Asian member of the Superman family. So he wanted to create a Chinese Superman, and he wanted me to write this new character. When he first brought this to me, I said, no, that sounds like a terrible idea. I want nothing to do with it. And I found it so terrible because it was terrifying to me. Uh, I grew up as the son of these immigrants. My mom came from mainland China. Her family left just as the Communist Party was coming into power. My dad uh, was born in Taiwan, so I grew up with these incredibly strong opinions about the political situation in China. As an adult, I realized that those opinions are not the only viewpoint out there, and that modern China is a very, very complex place. Even so, I saw that Superman is supposed to express 
truth, justice, and the American way. So what does that mean for a Superman character in China? I felt like there were too many political landmines. I did not want to deal with it at all, so I said no. Then I got called into the offices at Burbank, the DC offices at Burbank. Uh, Jim Lee called me into his office. It was amazing. I sat there for about an hour with him talking. I don't remember a single word out of his mouth. I just spent the whole hour staring at his face. And after that, I said yes. So now I'm working on the new Superman comic. The, there are actually four issues out. I didn't include the fourth issue on this slide. I'm working on the eighth right now. I also teach creative writing. So I teach through Hamlin University in Minnesota. And one of the uh, pieces of advice that I hammer into my students is that whatever you're afraid of in writing, you should just run straight at it. And I decided I had to take that advice for myself as well. So for this first storyline, New Superman, the Chinese Superman's nemesis, is a group of costumed supervillains who are pro-democracy advocates. I'm trying to run straight at what I'm afraid of. Well, once again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for braving the weather. Thank you for making it so exciting for me. Are there any questions that I can answer for you? Yes. Uh, rather than go for an obvious one, uh, what were your influences for the Eternal Smile? That's awesome. Thank you for asking for the, uh, about the Eternal Smile. Nobody ever asked about that book. That was a book that I did in 2009 with my friend Derek, who looks like me. I did the writing and he did the art. And that is a collection of three short stories done in three different styles. It could be done in three different styles because Derek is an amazing artist. He's like a chameleon. He can adopt any style he needs to to tell the story. And they're all about the relationship between fantasy and reality. I gotta say, when I was around your age, I was a geek, but I was a little bit ashamed of being a geek. I don't think there was as much geek cred back then as there is today, right? And fantasy is a huge part of geek life. So back then, I just thought of fantasy as pure escapism. Like it was a way for me to get away from the harsh realities of my world. As I got, as I, as I got older, as I became a, more of an adult, I realized that that's not all fantasy is. Fantasy is sometimes a way for us to talk about complex and difficult issues in real life in a way that's more palpable and understandable. So those three stories together, Derek and I hope, will show that transition in, in the way we thought of fantasy. Any other, uh, any other questions I can answer for you? I got microphones. <laughs> yes. So you said you had this theory that Superman is a secret Asian American. Oh, here we go. You said you had this theory that Superman is a secret Asian American, and then you got to write Superman. So did your theory influence the way that you approached the character in your run? Uh, okay, so I, I said that I, was, I had this theory that Superman was a, was a secret Asian American. It was always in the back of my head. One of the things that I realized after jumping into the DC pool is that writing for DC Comics is very different from writing graphic novels for first, second books. Uh, one of the things is that there are many more layers of bureaucracy in DC Comics. So sometimes before you can run with an idea, you have to get approval for it first. And it took me a little while to figure out how to get that approval. So. Um, one of the things I really wanted to explore in my run on, on Superman was the, the character's connection to the immigrant story. I don't know if a lot of that actually came through. I was able to do one thing though, it took me a really long time to get this approved. But for three issues, for issues 47, I'm sorry, 40, 45, 46, and 47, I was able to bring Superman to Oakland, California and have him wrestle in an underground wrestling league. It took me a long time to get that approved. They only let me do it for three issues. I would have just left them there if I could. But the, but the Underground Wrestling League is made up of forgotten mythologies from, from non-white mythologies. Yeah, so it's like the, um, the, the Filipino god of the sun and the Filipino god of the moon, you know, characters like that. Korean god of the sun. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Growing up, when you first saw Superman comics and the staunchly heteronormative Anglo-Saxon kind of appearance, did you ever feel discouraged from pursuing comics through the lack of representation? And did you ever feel that in your lifetime you would have an opportunity to make really the antithesis of that, which is the diverse, you know, Chinese American Superman that you got to do? 
Yeah, I, okay, so, so yeah, so Superman really looks like the man, right? Like if you had a picture of the man, it would be, it would be Superman. And it's really weird because he's from another planet. So it's weird that this other planet had the same evolutionary uh, cycle that we did and produced like people who look exactly like us. I never felt like they properly addressed that in the comic and I always wondered why. I, I do think though, um, if you look at Superman a little bit more closely, it really is about the Jewish American experience. You know, a lot of Jews were able to pass, at least visually, and, and, uh, and it was about being able to fit in visually, but still feeling like an outsider. So Superman was able to pass visually. Deep down inside, he still was conflicted. He still had this conflict between his Kryptonian heritage and this American culture that surrounded him. Um, but, but to answer your other question, no, this is crazy. Like my life is really crazy. If I thought, think about it too hard, I just feel freaked out. Like I, I just don't, I don't get how all this stuff happened. You know what I mean? Like to get to write a, a Chinese Superman has been absolutely nuts. I, I do think that uh, in superhero comics and American superhero comics right now, there are these two competing forces. The vast majority of people who currently read American superhero comics are people like me. They're like men in their 40s who grew up reading comics. And most superhero comic readers are not necessarily looking for anything that pushes the envelope. They're looking for stories that make them feel like they did when they were 12. So the characters that they're attached to were characters that date back to the 70s and 80s, who are mostly you know, white heterosexual males. So one of my goals is to try to get a more diverse readership for American superhero comics. I really don't think that things are going to change until that happens. So I'm an education major, which you can probably tell by my question. Um, so what advice do you have for a teacher that wants to integrate graphic novels into their curriculum? First, I think that's awesome. I think that's amazing. Uh, there are two different ways, I think. Two, two major different ways. There are lots of different ways of using comics in the classroom, but there are two big ones right now. One is to use them in reluctant reader settings. And I think for a school community that, that is reluctant to bring in comics, that is a great way of doing it. You could, there's plenty of research out there to show that comics are, great, are a great gateway to other forms of reading. You know, uh, your average comic book reader actually reads six more novels every year than your average American. Which actually might say something about the average American, but it's, that, that's still there. I got that from Paul Levitz, who was the head of DC Comics. Um, so that's a great way, using, using comics to engage kids who might be other, otherwise might be adverse to read. The second way is to use comics to teach visual literacy. You know, I, I really think that in this culture, we have a tendency to question what we hear and what we read and believe what we see. And that doesn't always serve us, especially because we're surrounded by visual media, right? Comics are a great way of training people out of that, and that's part of visual literacy. That's a more difficult way of doing it, though. You know, like bringing them in in reluctant reader settings. Most principals will sign off on that in a heartbeat. Using it to teach visual literacy is a little bit more difficult. Can you talk a little bit about the secret coders? Oh yeah, sure. Thanks for asking about secret that. coder. <laughs> secret coders is my most recent graphic novel series. The second one came out about about two uh, a month ago. And it's a series that I've been thinking about for a long time. I used to teach high school computer science. I taught high school computer science for 17 years. And I teach in this really visual way. I do a lot of drawing on the board. I always thought a lot of those lessons could work really well in graphic novel format. So that's what Secret Coders is. It's my attempt to teach middle grade students how to code computers, the fundamentals of computer science. I'm teamed up with this guy named Mike Holmes, who's an amazing artist, he's an amazing cartoonist. He actually worked on the Adventure Time comics before working with me on Secret Coders. So he has that, you can just tell, just from the way he draws. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about it. I, it's my first educational, like explicitly educational book. And I really think that in America, the, you know, the, the educational graphic novel market is still in its infancy. If you go to Asia, especially Korea or Japan, you'll see shelves and shelves of educational comics because there's just certain topics that are better taught through comics. And here in America, we're still trying to figure it out. Oh. Uh, um, 
you had uh, talked about the 1940s characters that are in public domain, and there was one that came out uh, quite a while ago that uh, had a rebirth effect in Dynamite Comics, The Green Llama. And uh -huh. considering that he's kind of the exact opposite of everything you've been talking about today, uh, I was kind of curious as to what your thought, thoughts were on the character. About Green Llama? Yeah. This is so nerdy. This is, it's amazing. <laughs> okay, so Green Llama is a public domain character. He, he, was, he was mildly popular, right? He was not like Green Turtle. Green Turtle was not popular at all. And, and Green Llama is part of a, like a, a, a trope in American storytelling called White Man is the Best Asian. It's where a white character goes to Asia, trains in some Asian discipline, and becomes the best at it. Like he becomes even better than all the Asians that surround him. Yeah. So like Iron Fist is one. Like, there's just so many. All the, all the Kung Fu movies that I grew up with when I was a kid were, were examples of that. So I, I do, like, number one is I think that um, just as a, a nerdy comic book fan, there's something really endearing about a character that calls himself Green Llama. <laughs> it's just so goofy. But at the same time, I would love to see another take on that character, where, where um, a writer approaches that character aware of the problematic roots. Oh, yes. So you sold eight dollars worth, but do you still have a copy of the Spade Hero comic? The Spade Hunter. Yeah. I still have a copy of the Spade Hunter. I gotta tell you, I, I did this radio interview where I mentioned Spade Hunter and the African American um, uh, man who was working the boards kind of spat out his co coffee when, when I said Spade Hunter. Because I mean, it's I guess it's a, like a racial term, right? We didn't mean it that way. Like Jeremy and I, we just liked the way the shape of the spade looked in a deck of cards, and that's why we chose it as the Superman or the, the superhero symbol. Um, but I think I might still have copies of it, like somewhere at my parents' house. If I dig in one of the drawers, I think I have a copy of it. It was a really terrible comic, like really terrible. Terrible enough where you know we'd sell it to our friends, and our friends would come to us and go, "What are you trying to draw in this panel? You know, tell me what this panel is." That's how terrible it was. So when you create content and your thought process behind it, do you create content that represents yourself or the general Asian American community? So when I create content, what am I thinking? You know, the main thing I'm thinking when I'm creating a story is I want to tell a, a story that is compelling enough that a reader will be willing to finish it, will be willing to get to the end, right? In whatever way I can do it, that's what I want to do. But that said, I do think that a lot of my stories are rooted in my own experience. There's this book called Story by a guy named Robert McKee. It's about screenwriting. And almost everybody who's involved in uh, screenplay writing or comic book writing has something to say about that book. It's a little bit controversial. Some people love it, some people hate it. But in that book, he talks about how there are three different kinds of research that somebody has to do in order to create a story. One is traditional book research, where you go to the library and you read about something. Two is research of the imagination where you sit down and you set aside time to think through a piece of your story. And the third is research of memory, where you draw on your own feelings, your own emotional experiences to tell that story. I think I rely pretty heavily on memory research in order to tell my stories. So a lot of the stuff, um, I don't really think about it in terms of being a, a general story about the Asian American experience. I've, I've just lived an Asian American life, so when I do memory research, that's the kind of stuff that comes up. Um, so I was wondering, how do you define your work like as graphic novels or comics or a combination of both? And um, do you write them differently if you set out to like write a graphic novel? a comic novel book or versus or a comic? Write, yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So, so here's my understanding of the origin of the graphic novel, the term, the graphic novel term. In, in the 1970s, Will Eisner, who I showed earlier, um, he had this these comics that were not about superheroes. They're about these Jewish kids growing up in a neighborhood in New York. They're based on his own childhood. And he went around to these different publishers and he said, I have these comic books about these Jewish kids. And nobody wanted to publish it. And then he went around to those same publishers and he said, I have this graphic novel about these Jewish kids. And he's able to pick up a publisher. So from the very beginning, the term graphic novel has been a way for cartoonists to separate the format of comic books from the genres that have dominated it, from superheroes and from funny animals. Um, it's, I, I think it's worked, right? I think it's worked. Like if you look at the diversity of, of stories told through graphic novel format nowadays, 
It's just, it's not all superheroes and, and funny animals. So it's really important. But at the same time, like, when, when I talk to more general audiences, I use those terms in the, interchangeably. When I talk to other cartoonists, we just call them, like, comic books. We just say comic books, you know? So I don't really think of them as two different things. I think of one as just like a, uh, almost like a political term. Yes? Uh, what's your opinion on Frank Miller's Roman and was it influenced on uh, American War Chinese? What's my opinion of Frank Miller's Ronin? I have not read it since I was a teenager, so I don't know how I would think about it as uh, an adult. But when I was a teenager, I was blown away. I don't know if you all are familiar with this book, but it's a, it's a book done by one of the most influential superhero cartoonists of the 80s and 90s, a guy named Frank Miller. It's set in the future. It draws really heavily on, on, uh, on Japanese historical culture. And it also has a fold-out page. So you get to this one point in the comic, and then you fold it out. And I remember when I was like 16 and I read that, I was like, whoa, that's amazing. That's shocking. Uh, so Frank Miller in general, I think he, like he had a huge influence on American comics. He, he did a book called The Dark Knight Returns, which came out in 1986, I believe. And after that, for about a generation, everyone working in superhero comics was trying to ape Frank Miller. I do think, though, that my natural storytelling sense is kind of the exact opposite of Frank Miller's. Like, he's like really gritty and dark and kind of like manly, and my comics are just not, you know? So, um, so it, in a lot of ways, I think my work is part of this new trend that is pushing against the, the grim and gritty aesthetic that Frank Miller and, and Alan Moore established. This will be the last question, and then uh, we're going to let Gene sign books. Uh, what comics have you been reading lately? What comics have I been reading lately? Right now, I am in the middle of The Vision, which is amazing. I saw the numbers on it, it doesn't sell very well, you all need to buy this book. You know the vision, you know who the vision is? He's an Avenger. Remember in Avengers 2, they built, like Jarvis, the, 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 the computer becomes like this robot, and he's like red and green and yellow, he has like this really goofy costume. That's the vision, he's a robot. And in this series, he feels lonely, so he builds for himself a robot family. He builds a robot wife, he builds robot kids, they move to Washington, D.C., they, they buy a house in the suburbs, and they try to live like a normal family. Unfortunately, in the first issue, the supervillain attacks, Vision's not home, and the supervillain attacks, it attacks the kids, and the mom, like the mom robot, kills, like she just straight up kills the supervillain, and then buries him in his backyard, in the backyard. But he doesn't want, so because the Vision is an Avenger, she can't tell him. So they're trying to live this normal life when there's a supervillain buried in the backyard. It's amazing. It's an amazing comic. You guys all should read it. It's awesome. I'm also really into Hellcat. You guys know what Hellcat is? I'm like selling the competitions book. This is another Marvel book. Okay, Hellcat is one of the most fascinating characters in the Marvel Universe. So in the 1940s and 50s, Archie was a big deal. Archie and Betty and Veronica, they were among the most popular comics in America, right? So Timely, which later became Marvel, tried to create a character that would compete. And they created a character named Patsy Walker, teen model. So she was a teenager who had a modeling career. All of her stories were kind of like Archie's stories. They were all about like teenage hijinks. And then eventually Archie went out of fashion. Patsy Walker stopped being published. Then Marvel goes through this resurgence in the 1960s. They become the superhero powerhouse. And they get this bright idea, let's bring Patsy Walker back. But let's bring her back as a superhero this time and name her Hellcat and give her this awesome yellow costume. And let's also keep all of her backstory as a teen model intact. <laughs> so she is a teen model who becomes a superhero. And all of those stories are, are, are in canon. That's what makes her amazing. She jumped from one genre to another. You all should be reading that, those books. The, the Vision and, uh, and Patsy Walker Hellcat. I should, I should pitch one more for DC, right? I should pitch one more for DC. <laughs> so DC, uh, Supergirl is an, is an amazing book. You guys should read Supergirl. It's done by Steve Orlando, um, one of the few LGBT writers in America, mainstream American superhero comics, and Brian Ching, uh, an Asian American comic book artist. Awesome book. If you like the, 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 the TV show, you'll love that comic.
All right, well, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Great to talk to you. Thank you.